the virtual room with us. My name is Tina Walla, and I'm with US Digital Response. I'll be your moderator for today's session. And it's really, I'm, I have to confess, I'm so excited I got this session because this is the one I wanted to attend. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Forum Fest 2023 session titled Pushing Paper, Building Flexibility into a Paper Form When Digital Isn't an Option. I'm really excited about this session. I have to tell you because uh, this is one form of a formative form story. Uh, when I, uh, one of my previous stints in government, I worked for the city of Seattle. I got so excited and inspired by the lab at DC uh, because they held a form of Palooza where they brought to life what real like participatory community engagement looks like on forms. So I have to tell you, like I am nerding out and so excited for today's presentation. I'll share that this is gonna be a one hour session. Our speakers will present first, and then we're gonna save the last 20 minutes for questions from all of you. If you have a question during the presentation, uh, just drop it in the chat. Uh, my partner, uh, Colleen, is gonna be tracking and aggregating all your questions. We're gonna save that for a 20 minute uh, Q&A period at the end. Uh, I'll voice those out loud so the recording can capture those questions and answers for folks who are uh, watching after today. Now, enough of my uh, enough of me. Let's get to the real stars of the show. I want to turn the session over to Deborah Scott, Nellie Moore, and Ryan Flynn. Ryan is going to get us started by sharing his formative form story. So, Ryan, take it away. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, everyone uh, at Code for America and the Beck Center. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Tina, we're happy you're our moderator, too. Um, and we're happy to have a chance to, to nerd out with a bunch of other self-described form, form geeks uh, this afternoon or morning, uh, depending on where you're coming from. So when I was just uh, starting to work, I did my taxes uh, by hand from beginning to end for several years. Um, part of it was that I wanted to learn about the process and the form. Part of it was uh, I felt like it was my civic duty to understand those things. I mean, part of it was I was doing a lot of work internationally and, and the tax preparation softwares didn't really meet my needs. Um, and I learned that the paper you see um, is just the beginning. Um, it requires an awful lot of heartache and decision making and research. Um, all of that is behind the form, but integral to the experience. Um, and I carry that with me. Um, and so we want to talk about uh, today um, something that may seem to you a bit unusual for a fo uh, focus on or the focus of this event on digital. Uh, service delivery. We want to talk about paper. Now, um, we're not here to tell you that we've seen the future and it's made from trees, um, but we um, do want to talk a little bit about when one might choose not to make the move to be digital. Um, we hear very much the benefits um, that have been coming up through this entire conf uh, conference related to accessibility, speed, flexibility, responsiveness. Um, but we also uh, ag agree with the, the um, uh, director from the White House last year that noted that only 2% of federal forms have been digitized, that there's a lot of work left to do. Um, and that's true for us in the District of Columbia government as well. Um, and that will take time. And so we want to talk a little bit about how we manage that. Um, while I'm introducing us, I'd like to um, start off with a quick poll just so we can learn a little bit about uh, you as well. You should see on the right hand side of your screen um, that a poll has come up. And so we're interested to know what's the focus of your work? Well, I tell you a little bit about us. Um, the work we're sharing today is all housed within the government of the District of Columbia, the city of Washington, DC, um, but it's a collaboration across many different agencies. Um, that includes the District of Columbia Housing Authority, which provides uh, quality affordable housing uh, for low to moderate income residents through public housing like Section 8, um, investments in mixed income communities, and also housing vouchers, uh, which is the focus of our work today. They work very closely with our Department of Human Services, or DHS, um, to help folks access vouchers. Um, and DHS supports residents to access public benefits, provides youth community services, and provides services um, for residents who are housing insecure or unhoused. Um, and, and this project fits very much in that, that third bucket. Um, we are here representing much larger teams. Uh, and we're lucky to have Deborah Scott with us from the Housing Authority, who's going to tell us a little bit about, um, about some of the work in a moment. 
But let me introduce um, Nellie and myself first. Uh, we work at a we're an organization called the Lab at DC. Uh, we sit in the office of the city administrator fairly centrally in district government. Um, and we're a team of social scientists, data scientists, and designers uh, who partner with agencies on service delivery challenges. Um, it could be an evaluation. Um, in this case, it's a design challenge to improve the experience of applying for a housing voucher in Washington, DC. All our work happens through deep partnerships with government agencies. Uh, we provide some technical know-how and a willingness to roll up our sleeves, but the agencies really lead the work. Um, in this particular project, uh, our team at the lab at DC was complemented and, and augmented by five resident researchers. Um, these are folks who currently hold housing vouchers, um, who we hired for both their research expertise and their experience going through the process. Um, and they helped us with research design, uh, with the synthesis of information, um, and with generating recommendations. And they were much richer for their input. Um, I want to make sure that folks are seeing the results of the poll before I close it. Does everyone have a sense of who they are, uh, who's here? So it looks like we have, it looks like we have a good mix um, of folks who work on primarily digital, primarily on paper PDF in both. Um, which is which is good. Hopefully there's something for everybody uh, here and, and maybe we don't need to be the apologists for paper first that we think we do. Um, but we want to tell you about three things today. Um, the first is we want to tell you a little bit about the context and um, the uh, the problems that that the housing authority and and DHS and the lab sought to address um, and why paper first made it made sense in that uh, in that context. Then we want to tell you about a couple strategies that we've used to make um, the process as seamless um, and intuitive and smooth as possible, given the limitations of paper. Um, and finally, we want to tell you a little bit about where we're going next. And it's important to note uh, that this work is very much um, still in progress. Uh, we're not here to, to um, sort of claim victory. Uh, and we want to share it in the spirit of sharing early um, and uh, sharing something that's, that's in, in process um, because we want to hear from you as well. And so your questions and comments today will enrich the conversation, but um, will also enrich our work. So uh, thank you very, very much for being here with us. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Deborah, who's going to talk a little bit about the context. Well, Deborah, you're muted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, so what is a housing voucher? It is a government subsidy that helps low-income individuals and families afford a place to live. Um, the recipients choose their rental unit and pay about 30% of their income towards rent, while the voucher covers the rest. Um, but vouchers vary depending on the government agency that manages them, who funds them, meaning the federal government or local government, which applicants qualify for them, and where the vouchers can be used. So tenant-based vouchers can be used in the private market, while unit-based vouchers are used in designated buildings. So the problem is that no one is on the same page. And the reason why uh, no one's on the same page is because as you see here, there are different application paths depending on the type of voucher for which one is applying, either a federally funded or a locally funded voucher. Some applicants follow the federal path where they apply directly to the housing authority to be placed on our waiting list. Um, and then when they're selected from the list, then they're sent uh, a packet of forms to complete but many applicants follow the local path where they apply through one of several pathways facilitated by the Department of Human Services that matches them with a local voucher and also connects them with a case manager who assists them with filling out the forms. Um, and regarding the application itself, for the federal path, once an applicant fills out their forms, uh, they return the complete application packet to the housing authority, along with supporting documents to prove things like their identity, income, et cetera. 
And for the local path, uh, where case managers assist the applicants with filling out their forms, if they're missing any verification documents, they can complete a self-certification form to uh, certify things like their identity, age, income, et cetera. And then their case managers certify their residency in the District of Columbia. Um, now, regarding the review of these applications for the federal path, once the application and supporting documents are received by the housing authority, they're reviewed for accuracy and completion. And if anything is missing, then the housing authority reaches out directly to the um, applicant. Um, but for the local path, the case manager submits the application and supporting documents to the Department of Human Services where they review everything. And then if something's missing, they contact the case manager if more is needed. Um, once the Department of Human Services completes their review and confirms that everything is good, then the application is forwarded to the housing authority for review. So as you can see, the processes and forms used across these different pathways are not always the same. And this uh, revision, this form revision is fairly unique in our history because two agencies play a significant role in the application process that the form supports. So creating a form that meets both agencies' needs and uses has required a lot of coordination and partnership with senior staff at both agencies. Okay, so here are some numbers related to our current forms. There are currently 41 pages total in the current application with a minimum of uh, 22 pages needed to complete, app, uh, to complete the application and a maximum of 32 pages for completion. And the reason why there are 41 total pages but a maximum of 32 for completion is because not all forms are required for every applicant. And it takes about an hour and a half for an applicant to get through the application packet, complete all the forms. And it takes typically takes 30 days for the housing authority to determine eligibility. Um, sometimes it does take longer because of some of the pain points in the process that can lead to delays, which we'll talk about in a subse subsequent slide. Um, some of the big ones include needing to go back to clients because forms aren't filled out correctly or um, if required verification doc documents are not submitted. And the complicated nature of managing a workflow across two agencies can also add to the processing time. Uh, this uh, form revision uh, grew out of the Department of Human Services concern with voucher utilization and the agreement between them and the housing authority that the current form is a barrier to a smooth experience for applicants and staff alike. Some of the improvements that we hope the redesign will, con uh, will contribute toward are quicker turnarounds because different requirements across voucher types can lead to confusion, mistakes, and applications being sent back for, for correction. So clearer instructions could mean fewer mistakes and faster review times. Streamlined and secure workflow, because in a paper and email-based system with a lot of back and forth, forms can be lost and personal information is harder to keep safe. Better alignment, because case managers often lack technical support on how to complete the ap application. And there's not just one source of truth on the requirements. And ultimately more capacity because, because many more local vouchers were funded in 2022 and 2023, and ultimately a more streamlined application process would allow the housing authority to house more eligible applicants. And um, here we're doing uh, another poll um, about the biggest challenge you face in your work on forms and notices. And we're just gonna take a moment um, to take a look at those.
Okay. Okay. Well, um, it is, here's a, a quote uh, by Department of Human Services staff member. Um, it's difficult to work with a different agency and rely on one another to serve clients. It makes the process convoluted and unnecessarily complicated. It confuses residents and leaves them frustrated. I think we can all relate to the challenges that come with collaborating with people outside of our groups and organizations. Um, and so for us, while the need for collaboration isn't likely to go away, better alignment between the Housing Authority and Department of Human Services through and beyond the forms themselves may reduce confusion for everyone in the process. And now I will hand it off to you, Nellie. Thanks, Deborah. I, I see that um, quite a lot of people uh, shared that they also have uh, issues with process alignment uh, across teams and agencies as the, the biggest challenge they face in their work on forms and notices. Okay. This is where uh, we'll really get into the meaty bits uh, about how we've gone about this paper form redesign. And first, I'll tell you a little bit about our process overall. Um, and then like Ryan previewed, we'll talk about some of the strategies and tactics that we use to make the absolute most that we could out of a paper-based form revision. We started this work early this year. Um, we began by mapping the various resident paths. Uh, we cataloged around 40 uh, discrete forms and notices that residents may encounter in applying for a voucher. Um, and when we audited those forms, uh, we generated over 500 questions and comments with senior members of the Housing Authority um, and the Department of Human Services to determine the program and legal constraints uh, of the redesign. Now this 500 number, it's, a, it's an easy to measure number because we tracked these back and forth in Adobe. Um, but it doesn't quite sort of convey the hours of meetings that the Housing Authority and the lab had discussing forms together and separately. And so what I really want to convey uh, in this number is just how much investigation it can take to understand an existing system of forms before you even start to think about changing anything about them. We also observed uh, residents, case managers, and uh, DHS and Housing Authority staff uh, who process and quality assure the applications to identify common errors. Um, and at this stage, we did a review of the regulation, regulations uh, to, that oversee the voucher process. There's quite a lot, both on the local and federal level. Um, and we continue to refer back to them uh, as we developed and tested the forms. All of that uh, provided the building blocks that we needed uh, for a revised packet. Our goal was not to recreate all 41 pages of the forms, but really we were looking uh, to create a more streamlined application packet that clearly walks applicants through what everyone fills out, what is only needed if you're applying for a federal program or a local program, and how to verify things like income and student status. And once we had developed uh, all of those pieces, we tested them in modules. Uh, with residents, the housing authority, uh, DHS staff, case managers, and third parties that included employers, schools, care providers, notaries, etc. We are so close. We're just about ready uh, to start piloting uh, these new forms, um, and I'm so excited. Uh, but I'll tell you more about those next steps uh, toward the end of the presentation. So now we will narrow in on a few tactics uh, that we use to make the most of this redesign. 
Um, as Ryan stated at the top of the presentation, just in case you came in a little bit late, we are redesigning the voucher application forms in paper. That means that they will be completed using a fillable PDF or printed or filled in by hand. And given that most of this event is focused on some really great digital work, uh, we know that this makes us somewhat the oddballs, but we think that we're in good company uh, based on uh, the poll that you all did. And we also know that starting with paper allowed us to start right away. Uh, even as the solutions needed for a fully online application process were considered and vetted and explored further, and it also allowed us to introduce improvements incrementally. So maybe you find yourself in the same boat and you'd like to think more about what you can do if digital is not an immediate option. And we found that there is quite a lot that we could do just with paper uh, to address the pain points that we are seeing in the process. Uh, we'll tell you how we used modules to reduce the number of forms each applicant completes to get closer to that minimum or maximum number, right? And having fewer people uh, actually touch all 41 forms. Um, and Ryan will tell you more about that. And then finally, I'll talk about what paper can't do on its own. And some exploration that we've done around complementary digital solutions to address those gaps. So Deborah, I'd love to pass it back to you uh, to say more about why and how uh, we did the redesign in paper. Uh, Deborah, you gotta unmute. I am so sorry. <laughs> so where we're starting from now is that applications are submitted primarily by email scans, postal mail or hand delivery. And then PDF versions of the applications are uploaded into various databases and manually transcribed into database fields. And there are over 500 case managers from various housing partners and agencies and dozens of uh, Department of Human Services and Housing Authority staff. Um, now, the process is complex, but manual, and it involves many, many parties. And changing it will take time, but uh, both to create the digital solutions and to manage the transition to digital. But meanwhile, there is still a lot we can do with paper. Uh, one thing we can do uh, with paper is to... Um, align the forms with our current systems and the paper redesign can alleviate pain points and address delays. Uh, what you see here are, uh, it compares the first page of our current application on the top, um, which includes a lot of information uh, that is no longer accurate and some of it just isn't needed, uh, to the new version on the bottom, which reflects our decision to be much more specific about what someone is applying for. And um, recently, the District of Columbia has also started funding local vouchers, as you saw earlier with the multiple paths. These local, va local vouchers have different requirements, but those are not reflected in the current form forms. And Ryan will discuss momentarily how the redesign forms address this issue. Okay, so um, anything we can do with paper forms, uh, another thing we can do with paper forms is to reduce redundancies. Um, here you can see at the top uh, part of our current um, application um, where informa demographic information is asked. Um, and then you will see um, at the bottom where this is a section of our packet that um, we use to for applicants to actually, uh, for us to determine their eligibility. And you notice that the same questions, um, you know, are, are duplicated here. Um, now, um, when the wait list uh, was open, applicants completed one set of forms to get on the waiting list, and that's the housing application, the one at the top. And then once they were selected from the list, to determine their eligibility, then they had to complete another set of forms. And that's uh, the example at the bottom. 
so now the wait list has been closed for many years and some of the information on the application, as I said before, may be missing or outdated. Um, and as a result, the housing authority was asking people to complete the wait list application again, in addition to the forms to check their eligibility. Um, these redundancies don't only extend the time it takes to fill out the forms, but when someone makes a mistake and the fields don't match, the review process takes a lot longer too. And here you can see an example of where the redesigned form removes those re redundancies that we just saw between the two sets of forms. And beyond these tactical approaches, there are also strategic reasons to start with paper. Even after a digital application is developed, some applicants will continue to need or prefer paper. So we expect the paper forms to re remain in use for some time. Um, in addition, hashing out the issues on paper means that even before putting fingers to code on a digital ap application, the many parties involved in the process agree on what should be included in the forms. And it's important to note that case managers meet with clients experiencing homelessness where they are to assist them with filling out the application. And this can be done in tents on the street, at shelters, et cetera. So sometimes paper truly is the only accessible option. And now I will hand it back to you, Ryan. Thanks, Deborah. So with that context, I wanna talk next a little bit about how we're working within the limits of paper to provide as efficient and accessible um, and pleasant an eligibility determination packet as possible. And we're using the term modular logic to describe our approach. As Deborah mentioned, the current eligibility packet um, services a variety of programs, um, each with slightly different information needs. What that means is that um, no matter who you are, what program you're entering, everybody can skip something. Um, with a digital application, you could use screener questions, branching skip logic to help make sure that folks were only encountering the questions they needed to answer. We wanted to follow that approach as closely as possible, given a paper format. And I want to share three strategies about how we're approaching this. Um, the first is breaking the application into, into three modules of which anyone would only complete two. The second is using skip logic and building um, in design patterns to try to make the navigation through the packet as, as um, clear and intuitive as possible. And the third is thinking a little bit differently about how we use forms to verify. Um, and so let's talk about the first one first. Yeah, on this slide, you see um, uh, our approach to modules. And so um, the current packet is 41 pages. And when I say current, I mean the, the pre-revised one um, because we haven't quite rolled this out yet. Um, so the current packet is 41 pages. Everyone gets the same packet. And oftentimes people, people fill out much of that packet, even though certain forms don't apply. Um, the biggest differences here are between federally and locally funded vouchers. Um, for example the, example, the program rules for local vouchers don't require a criminal background check um, or a check with the U.S. Customs and Immigration to check for legal presence. Um, on the other hand, local programs have more restrictive District of Columbia residency requirements. Um, our modular approach breaks out the forms that are only needed for federal or local programs um, and sort of mixes up what's in the current application packet to get that distinction. Um, so your application packet will only ever include an eight to 14 page core and then either a five page local supplement or a nine page uh, federal supplement. Now this approach relies on something that may not apply everywhere. So I just want to call it out. Um, for this process, there's always a housing authority um, staff member or um, a staff member at a partner agency intermediating the eligibility determination process. Um, this isn't an application you download by yourself and then can just sort of complete and send in. Um, it's either sent to you by a case manager um, when there's a determination made that there's there's a, a match for a voucher um, or when your name is pulled off the wait list. Uh, you also don't get to choose between a local and a federal voucher. At the time that that match is made, um, that decision is, is made for you um, based on availability um, and in some cases program fit. Uh, so, so at any rate, um, because of that, it's possible to curate a core and one supplement. Um, now, if you go to the next slide, Nelly, um, I want to talk about a, another strategy, which is trying to 
uh, do the best we can with visual design elements to help skipping and wayfinding. And this applies primarily to the core application. Um, the core application gathers information that's needed for both the federal and the local program. You can think of this sort of as the center of the Venn diagram. Um, and it's information like uh, the names of the people in your household, uh, household earnings, if you have any, uh, savings, certain out-of-pocket expenses that can be used to increase the value of your voucher, um, requests for accommodation to make sure your unit is accessible. Um, but even within that packet, it's not the case that every question may fit your circumstances. And so some skipping is needed. Um, and so we use a couple strategies to, to facilitate that. If you go to the next slide, Ned, uh, Nelly. Um, so the first is that we break the application into logically coherent parts and we label them. Uh, Deborah showed you the current packet um, that asks people to list their household information twice. Uh, that's not the case anymore. So what you see on the screen here is, is part three. Um, it's focused on income. It's really the only place we ask you in the application about household income. Um, and we do our very best with the size of the typeface, the color, the use of white space to make both the part label and the topic as prominent as possible. So you can identify it quickly, even if you're flipping through an application. Um, the next strategy is um, including on every page a description of the conditions under which the page is needed. Um, everyone needs to complete parts one through eight of the packet. Um, and so that's what this note says on the top. And so if you're on part three, um, you know this applies to you, hopefully. Um, there are also other sections that say only complete this if you're instructed to in part four um, to help people uh, help facilitate skipping. Um, and then one other strategy is um, we let folks know when they can leave a section blank using prominent visual design, um, which if you go to the next slide, Nellie will, will circle. Um, we found during discovery that, that many folks felt uncomfortable leaving sections blank, even if they could have. Um, and so um, we, we try to call out that um, uh, with a really prominent note that you can skip this section if it doesn't apply to you um, very clearly. Um, and we integrate that into the flow um, by adding a checkbox that, that people can uh, can check to say yes, this doesn't um, this doesn't apply to me, and that does a couple things. Um, it, it helps it helps um, address the urge to do something and just not skip. Um, and it also helps confirm understanding and shows that this um, shows to the person who's reviewing the application that the section was skipped intentionally. So, um, if you go to the next slide, Nelly, I want to talk about a slightly different situation. Um, there's some information in the core application that's required only if a certain situation applies, um, and that situation doesn't often apply. Uh, take, for instance, the example of household assets. Um, assets are things like savings, uh, real estate, investments. Currently, the housing authority only really needs to know more about your assets if, if your family has um, $15,000 or more, and that doesn't apply to many people um, applying for a voucher. And so, um, because we're concerned about people filling out uh, information they don't need to, we, we fudge our rule about only asking about a certain topic in this in one section just a little bit. So here's the asset section. Um, and we asked just one question instead of the, the big table that was present in the um, in the current application. Um, it asked basically, does the case that you have assets more than $15,000 apply to you? Um, if the answer is no, then check the box and you've completed the application, this part of the application in, in one question, which we think is a big improvement. Um, but if the answer is yes, then you need to pay attention to part nine, um, which is farther down in the core application um, behind things like disclosures and signatures. Um, it feels a little bit like an addendum, and that's partially the intent um, to allow most folks to who it doesn't apply to, to feel comfortable just moving on beyond it. Um, the, the gamble here, and which we've been testing, is um, do we do enough with wayfinding to help folks find those farther down parts to um, to make sure they complete them? And so far, um, we're finding that it's, it's working fairly well, but we're still we're still working on it. Um, Nelly, if you go to the next slide, I want to show you what this looks like in practice. So this is the core application. It's it's 14 pages. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, this shows you sort of the most common situation. So uh, this is a household of fewer than six people or six people or fewer with some income um, without needing to declare assets or unreimbursed expenses. Um, and so you only complete the first eight pages. Now, let's say you had um, some unreimbursed disability expenses that you wanted to show. Um, you would check a box in, in farther up in the application and also complete part 11. Um, and so that's how it sort of intended to work in practice. Um, one final strategy for creating a smooth throw for the paper application 
um, is on the next slide. And so what you're seeing on the screen right here is the information page in the revised application. Um, you'll notice that the first step is completing all the forms we were just talking about. Um, however, the second step is providing the documents you need to um, allow the housing authority to verify the information that you entered on the forms. Um, the housing authority needs to verify information like um, your legal name, date of birth, social security, number if you have it, um, in employment income, and some other things. Um, it's, if these verifications can't be done, the application is delayed. And, and we found that that's a really big source of delay, um, particularly if folks are hard to track down after the application is completed. Um, so the first best option is to provide um, information like government IDs, birth certificates, or pay stubs. But if you can't easily provide that as proof, you can complete another reform. And those forms are currently included in the application packet, even though it's not ideal that you use them. And again, we found that many people are filling out these verification forms, sort of the information about the information, um, even though they don't need to, because either it's not clear exactly what you need to verify something or people feel uncomfortable leaving information blank. Um, so to avoid the time and potential discomfort involved in, in providing this type of verification information, some of which needs to go to your employer or your doctor or your child's school and have them sign off on it, uh, we've decided to just take these out of the packet and instead include a table, which I'll show you on the next slide. So this provides a bit of ground truth for everybody. In column one, you see what you need to verify. This is just a subset. Um, in column two, you see who needs who we need the information about, and sometimes it's not everyone in the household. And in column three, it's an exhaustive list of documents that you can use to verify that information. So for instance, if you're applying for a locally funded voucher, um, you need to verify your residency in DC. That only needs to be for the applicant, and you can use a, a variety of forms to do that, including a government issued ID, um, pay stubs, tax records, a lease, bank statements, uh, benefits records, or medical records. Uh, and that goes all the way down to everything that needs to be verified. Now, in some cases, it's not convenient to provide those documents. And so, so there are verification forms. Um, and that shows up in the next column, which Nellie's just showed you. Um, there's 11 verification forms total. That's how we go from the, the 23 pages of the core and sup, uh, federal supplement all the way up to 34. In practice, um, you generally don't need more than a handful. Um, like for instance, there's forms to both verify that you have income and don't have income and, and you wouldn't use both. Um, because we want people to not waste time filling out things they don't need to, these are included as links in the application packet. So if you have a smartphone or a computer, you can download them or a case manager can provide them. Um, but of course we know that tables can be difficult to read and it's not an ideal solution for everybody. So we're really focusing on testing this to see if it works. Um, which brings us to the, the, the last poll, which um, I, I want to, queue up now um, and people can respond to well I, I hand it over to Nelly this is um uh, let's see oh, sorry uh, this is uh, a poll you should see that asks you what do you think is the biggest pain point identified by residents when they were testing that table and includes confusion about the purpose of the table miscategories, categories uh, people miscategories categories that applied to them People provided information on categories that they did need not, did not need to apply to. Um, I'm sorry, people provided information on categories that they did not apply to them. People provided more documents than they needed to for categories that applied to them, or they didn't have easy access to the acceptable documents. Um, Nellie's gonna talk about some strategies to mitigate some of these concerns, but we're really curious to think what your first takes are uh, on, on this piece. Um, so Nellie, over to you. I'll close the poll in just a minute. All right, thank you. And, and Tina, I see you there that we, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it brief. Uh, so we've just spent a lot of time telling you all the things that we thought that we could do with paper uh, to make this application easier uh, in our particular context. Um, but we know that there's still a lot of ways in which paper is not uh, the full solution for us. Um, and so we've started to explore uh, some digital solutions that can complement the paper revision. Um, and this is at really early stages compared to the redesign as a whole. I just wanted to include some of our thoughts about what we felt like we couldn't do with paper. Um, and rather than seeing paper and digital as alternatives, we're really exploring them more as complements. Uh, so right now we're looking at solutions that would help applicants navigate that verification process Ryan just described uh, more easily and solutions that would better protect their data. 
So again, uh, you can see this table um, as Ryan described. I'm eager to see what you all thought about um, what the biggest pain point would be. It does provide a ground truth, and it's a helpful resource, particularly for case managers. Um, but the complex logic, and, and I'll say there's actually nine categories here. We've simplified it even for you. Um, so this logic, it's oversimplified for somebody who is otherwise unfamiliar with the program requirements. Um, it felt necessary, but not ideal. Um, and in testing, um, applicants and case managers, they're almost universally able to identify which documents they would need based off of this table. But many times they overselected out of caution. So for example, some people just read straight down column three um, that was something that we saw in a few instances. They started going across the row, but then they just kept going down column three, and that led them to overselect. Um, other people overselected on purpose, out of caution. Even we asked them, did you notice that instruction at the top about submit one for each row? And they're like, yeah, I saw that, but I'm still going to submit this, this, and that. Um, and so that was really helpful for us to learn as well. So I'm just showing here a mock-up um, of something like a quiz uh, that somebody could use uh, to check if their application is complete. Um, this is very low fidelity, like just for the purpose of showing you all what we're thinking of. Um, and so somebody would answer a few questions, what kind of voucher they have, how many people are in their household, and whether or not there's anybody in their household enrolled in kindergarten through 12th grade, for example. Maybe a few more questions after that. Um, the tool, it would tell them what things they need to submit, a core application, local supplement, and what things they need to uh, show proofs for. Um, and, and the final version of this would also give them options for which proof they would submit. And then for data security, uh, this tool ideally would also offer folks the option of uploading uh, each of these things that it has prompted them uh, that they need uh, to make sure that their application is complete. Um, and, and they would only need to upload one item for each. Um, and you know, this might end up looking very different. Uh, it might even be built directly in one of the agency systems. Um, but we just wanted to give you a sense of how a low fidelity digital solution could complement what we've done without a soup to nuts digital application process. Um, so to give you a sense of what we feel like we maybe have accomplished by now, remember this is still in progress. Um, we have been able to reduce the overall number of forms required uh, in the application process. And we've also brought the reading level down um, from an average of around six to seven to an average of four to five. And I was gonna tell you more about our next steps and certainly I'm very excited about them, but I think I'm just gonna finish here um, and maybe we'll talk about next steps in the um, uh, Q&A. Uh, but uh, here you see every page of the core and supplement uh, in the current version on the left. And in the revised version uh, on the right. And just for one example, um, here's somebody who is applying for a federal voucher off the wait list. Um, they would have needed 28 pages from the old application. Um, and on the right, you'll see that they would need 17 uh, from the new one. So I'm going to skip through the next steps, but I might come back to it later. Um, if it is relevant uh, to the Q&A. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Deborah, Ryan, and Nellie. This is really exciting. And there's a lot of questions in the chat, so eager to get to those. We've got about 15 minutes remaining in our time. So I'm going to start with a, a, a sort of straightforward question, uh, since our speakers just did a, a, a bunch of great presenting. Uh, we had a question both from Andy and Kelly in the chat. What tool are you using to re to design the redesigned forms? Um, I can take this one. Uh, we are building these in Microsoft Word. <laughs> yes, I love it. 
Um, we are trying to keep it as evergreen as we can. Uh, this is a tool that everybody in DCHA and everybody in DHS knows how to use already. Um, the lab are sort of, uh, we are here to support and, and be through the process of rollout, but we will not always be hand-holding uh, with our partners on these forms. Um, we are also, uh, though we have designer in our title, uh, not all graphic designers. Um, and so our, our skill levels vary. Um, Microsoft Word uh, is not ideal. I spent lots of hours uh, moving uh, rows and tables. Um, <laughs> even today, somebody asked me if I could change the type of bullet point in that document guide. And I'm like, I think that will take me at least an hour. Um, and so Microsoft Word, a little bit rough, uh, but ultimately we think it's the best decision. That's how we have actually designed every paper uh, form that the lab has redesigned, which is about 50 now. That's great. Thank you, Nellie. And what I do appreciate um, about that is you're, through this work, you're building in sustainability from day one. You're not using a, a maybe unknown software that would be harder for somebody to adjust later. So uh, it just makes great sense. And Nelly, you can feel free to take down your slides if you'd like. Um, I'm gonna move on to some questions we got related to sort of the user experience and testing that you all did. Um, so first, Kelly asked, how did you do testing for the paper forms? What did that look like? Should I take that one again, Ryan? Would you like to do? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to jump in and have Deborah and Nellie support. Yeah, me. go ahead. Um, so there's, there's, the, I think the first thing to note is that the, the testing starts even before you have a, a prototype um, that you want to dig deep on the form as it currently exists um, to understand really uh, if you, you can't do everything you need to make compromises, what's really causing a problem for uh, the user experience and um, here, you know, we, we really focused on core users, which are our applicants and the staff that support them at the Housing Authority and, and the um, Department of Human Services and, and others. Um, and so we, we led a fairly lengthy discovery process um, that involved sitting with users and uh, both staff and, and residents as they, as they completed the form um, and then forming some theories about, you know, what's the problem and digging deeper through, um, through interviews and some sort of putting paper in front of people. Um, with the prototypes themselves, uh, the testing was was more extensive than than we often do um, because there's so many different forms with so many different potential users. And so um, we started with you know small tests of individual things built to testing the packets themselves and how they performed in terms of time and effort. Um, and then um, when it came to verification forms, needed to sort of reach out wider beyond our core users because people who are filling that all also are school administrators or staff at doctors' offices. Um, or someone who's uh, a neighbor at your church who's giving you a bit of money. These are all sort of potential users. And so we needed to um, spread the net wide. And then, you know, you do that over and over again. You make changes, you go back, you make changes, you go back. The things that, that, that I'm sure everyone on this, um, this conference is fairly familiar with. Um, Nellie and Deborah, what would, you, what would you add to that overview? Um, I would just say that uh, so far uh, we've mainly uh, tested, and uh, maybe you said this right, I missed it, um, these paper forms in paper. We printed them out and we took to people, them to people and we asked them to write on them. Um, folks like Deborah on the DCHA side, um, they wrote along on a few of these tests. Um, and though many times, and there was some discussion in the chat, these are going to be used as fillable PDFs. We really wanted to get the content right first, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we'll do some usability testing of that fillable PDF. Um, sometimes it's hard to get people to actually write on the form. They just want to tell you their, their opinion, um, uh, but that worked out really well for us. Deborah, is there anything you want to add to that? Just in terms of thinking about, um, you know, the the users or the clients, the residents that are engaged here, what would you add? Um, I would just add that, just in general, I'm glad that we're going through this, you know, process because mm -hmm. 
um, you know, the forms we have, we've had them since like 2006. So, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback, um, you know, through the years and we're constantly sending things back and forth, but we never got to a point where we had the time or the ability or expertise to do something about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm, you know, glad that this uh, process extended, you know, to people who would actually be using the forms. Yeah. Well, and I think that's such a wonderful point you make about you've been get, you know you've been hearing feedback over the years, but this is an opportunity to really focus on that and make intentionally make that space. So that's that's great. Thank you. Um, I think during the as you as you all were sharing the sort of wayfinding in terms of the approach that you're using, we had some great questions that I want to pose here. Sean asked, "What's the guidance you're using when it comes to things like emphasis?" in terms of when you're bolding or italicizing, uh, thinking about the font size versus case. Um, how do you think about that? I know that's a bit of a technical question, but I imagine uh, many attendees are wondering. Brian, do you wanna take that one too? Yes, so so I mean, there's there's a couple of things. So one is that we want everything to sort of meet the, the web standards for legibility, because um, mm -hmm. a lot of these will be read right on the screen. And so there's, you know, there's tools to, to test that um, in terms of size, in terms of color contrast, um, in terms of, of typeface and all of that. Um, you know, beyond that, the, the main thing we go for is a clear hierarchy and information allow people to um, allow people to uh, sort of scan and, and get to where they need to be quickly. You know, what is this section about? Um, you know, where am I being asked to input information? Mm -hmm. um, some of that is a bit of an amalgam of our past experience in testing. Um, the housing authority's own style guide and design guide. Um, and then, uh, you know, taking an iterative approach um, to testing, seeing, testing, seeing how navigation goes. Um, I don't know if, I'd like to say that everything is, is sort of planned out, but I mean, obviously there's a bit of preference and style in, involved there as well. Um, but, you know, we're really focused on keeping a clear hierarchy and keeping it consistent um, and making sure it passed some basic tests. Um, so that's that's the approach. I hope that answers the question um, well enough. Yeah. Well, let me let me ask a follow up question. Um, this came from Jillian. How do you take into consideration a range of reading abilities? Um, but then also, you know, things come up like translations to other languages, uh, even the size of font for you know folks yes. like my mom, who yeah. you know may have a vision impairment and would benefit from not squinting at such tiny text. How have y'all thought about that? Yeah, I'll I'll take that at least to start on on the reading level um, uh, because I did the work to try to measure the reading level of the old and the, the new forms in their entirety um, in preparation for today. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, quite tricky overall to measure the reading level of an entire form um, because those individual fields can really bring down the, the average. Um, so there are places in our forums that, uh, despite the um, average reading level being around a grade four or grade five, there are paragraphs that are grade 12 or even higher. And those are the sort of legalese pieces that, you know, we can't get away from. And I imagine other people are encountering the same problems. Um, and so we really think carefully about uh, when we have a paper, like something that somebody's agreeing to, um, that we know is going to sort of contain some legal language. Um, mm -hmm. On one of the slides, um, uh, Ryan showed the sort of step-by-step -step process, the way that we've laid it out. Um, and in that step-by-step, -step, it lists all the forms in the supplements, which mainly are the ones with all the legalese. And we make a point of explaining on that first page mm -hmm. what somebody is going to find um, in that uh, authorization that they're sign find, signing later on. We can't change the authorization. Um, HUD has written it, it is OMB stamped. There's nothing much that we can do on the text of that itself. Right. Um, and there's a few other places where like with immigration status or citizenship or um, uh, federal voucher applicants, we've got to use some sort of 
very legal language, um, but we just make a point elsewhere in the forms to explain. And um, part of that is for the applicants themselves, and part of that is for the case managers, because the case manager who would walk an applicant in a local voucher program through the application, they would use that language even in our user tests to say, okay, well then I would say that like what they're signing for here is X, Y, or Z. And we tried to provide as much of that information for the case manager as we could. Um, in terms of other pieces of accessibility, um, we are uh, looking at translation. I saw somebody in the, um, in the chat. Oh, we do have a lot of experience with translation at the lab now. Um, and so we have some thoughts about how to do it, but at least for the pilot period um, and the initial rollout, it will be in English um, as we uh, update um, the form based on what we learn in the pilot and the initial rollout. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, those translations to roll them out a couple months later. Um, those will mostly be needed for the federal voucher applicants who are largely filling out the forms on their own. Um, local voucher applicants, even in the medium term, uh, when we don't have the translations yet, uh, they would be able to use a language line with their case manager to fill out the forms. Um, right. One of the tricks that we're worried about with translations uh, is that there's some forms that the applicant fills out the top and a third party fills out the bottom. I mentioned those employers, those schools, the notaries. And we are a little uh, not sure exactly how to address um, those particular forms, right? Where the top half is filled out by one person, bottom half by somebody else, they might have different language preferences. So if anybody in here has any thoughts on that, we would be very interested if you could share them in the chat. Hey, I love, love a call to action with a engaged uh, audience like we have today. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And um, I'm very sorry for those questions we didn't get to, but uh, there's a question that Andy dropped in the chat that I think could be a great way to sort of wrap this um, session. Deborah, I think in particular, you may have thoughts on this. Andy asks, do you think it's possible that findings in the form redesign process, all this work that you've been sharing out, is it possible that any of that will change, simplify, or standardize housing eligibility policy? Um, not the policy, <laughs> no, because we have, you know, regulations, um, local and federal government regulations that guide our policies. So, um, unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah. We can dream a dream, but right. <laughs> um, as Nellie mentioned a little bit ago, that that isn't under your control. Right, right. And, yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. I'm going to take advantage of the fact that that was a quick answer, Deborah. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let me ask a, a follow-up, Nelly. to, um, you were just speaking about in terms of like uh, taking into consideration reading abilities, translations. Uh, Molly asks, you know, you mentioned the legal language that you sort of put as an appendix. Is that legal language counted in the reading accessibility measurement when you, <laughs> when you do that assessment of, of reading level? Yes, um, it, it is when we use the reading formula. I really appreciate the resource Caroline shared because I was looking for something like that. Um, so I'm excited to look at it. But even as the legalese is included, um, the way that reading level formulas work, it really um, it's discounted because the legalese makes up a sort of smaller part of the forms. Um, mm -hmm. So when we did it, I looked at the average level of the whole form. Um, and when I took those averages, I also looked at the mode. Uh, so I was interested in like, what was the most common reading level? And it had been eight and it is four. But then for each form, I also looked at what is the highest rated paragraph in this form. Um, and those were 12 or more on some forms. And that's something that we were sort of interested in. Did it change? Did it not change? And I'm still digging more into it. It's very much a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, so really excited for any resources anybody has to share about that. Excellent. 
Thank you. I think that brings us uh, just about to time. So I want to, I know you the, the three of you cannot see the nearly 100 people uh, who are listening in and joining the session, but we're all just uh, giving gratitude and appreciation for the work you're doing and for you sharing it out. I want to say thanks to everyone for joining today's session. Um, I'll. Uh